Good day, everyone, and welcome back to this Share Cafe Hidden Gems webinar. Now, nothing for me today, believe it or not. I think the uh, the conversation on the Ukraine has been done to death, and I'll leave that to the experts. So we're going to make an immediate start. Now, just remember, all the recordings of these individual company presentations are available on our YouTube channel, or will also be on Share Cafe during the week. Now, don't forget to ask questions. The CEOs love the questions. Ideally, don't make yourself anonymous. We don't have time for the questions. A lot of the times, uh, the CEOs will answer those questions directly online. Um, so let's make an immediate start. First up, we have genetic signatures. ASX code GSS, market cap of around 192 million, one year return of minus 22%. The company is a specialist molecular diagnostics company focused on the development and commercialization of its proprietary platform technology three base. We have, and welcome back, the CEO and director, John Melke. John, over to you, thank you. Thanks so much, Tim. It's always a pleasure to be part of Share Cafe. Uh, I'm gonna use the next 10 minutes to, to introduce the company. To those that don't know us, I'm gonna highlight our half year financial results, which we just released this morning. Uh, and I'm gonna discuss our plans looking forward, particularly in that post COVID era. So if I can go through uh, to my first slide. So Genetic Signatures is a 20 year old listed company. We make molecular or PCR based tests to identify infectious diseases. So these are the microorganisms that infect humans. They make us sick. Some of them have a pretty high mortality rate. So it's really important to get in there and recognize them and accurately diagnose them. The tests we make are molecular, they're the gold standard test. They directly detect the nucleic acids of the organism. So they detect the DNA or the RNA rather than traditional methods which have to grow up the organisms before identifying them. So we're focused now on the commercialization of these infectious disease detection kits. They're in kit form. They utilize our proprietary three-base technology. And this was a technology that we developed here in Australia. And it's designed to change the organisms DNA sequence, and it makes it easier to detect. And the change in sequence means that our three-base technology is not affected by the most common mutations that we are seeing in SARS and, and other, other microorganisms. The kits we make are low cost, they're rapid, they allow accurate detection of infectious diseases. The result informs doctors to help them make a diagnosis and ultimately our test kits uh, help the doctor do that and ultimately we, we save lives. We do make these kits under the EasyScreen brand. They're available in most major markets, uh, global markets. We are concentrating our expansion into the very large European and US markets. Uh, we made test kits long before COVID. We've been selling versions of our kits for, um, for about 12 years. And we just reported this morning record first half results of almost 22 million in sales for the half. And that's up 17% as compared to the first half of last year. We do have a four year CAGR of 93%. We do have labs around the world using us every day. We're profitable. We have 37 and a half million in cash. We have no debt. And we just reported a 4.7 million profit for the half year. So, we, we have a footprint now in those target markets of Europe and the US. We are building off the considerable home-based success that we've had. And our three-base technology is key to that. And it's now a trusted and proven technology. And it helps us to make what we call syndromic kits. And you can see that on the next slide, what they do. And they actually allow labs to test for a really large number of clinically relevant organisms, pathogens. And respiratory is the best example. We all know that the symptoms are sore throat and runny nose, but right now it might well be SARS-CoV-2, but traditionally it could be influenza, which also has a high mortality rate. It could be rhinovirus, RSV. The tests that we make look for all of these infections in the one patient, effectively one test that can look for all of these. So in fact, we detect over 20 pathogens from just the one patient samples, and we do this in hours. Um, we have tests for over 100 organisms. Of course, it includes SARS-CoV-2, but other disease states too, which are really important because they cover things like gastroenteritis or antibiotic resistant bacteria and, and many more. But importantly, we have one common method and it works for all of our kits in exactly the same way. 
So once we have a customer on and they're using one of our tests, adopting additional tests that we put out is relatively easy. And the sales model itself is straightforward. Our customers are testing the diagnostic laboratories. They're high throughput, mid to high throughput, and they order kits from us. They pay us on standard terms. They use the test and they're generally reimbursed through government subsidies. In addition to making the assays, we also supply genetic signatures branded instruments, and they can you can see them on the slide there on the bottom right. And these are these are the printers in our printer and cartridge model. And importantly, we have quadrupled the number of these genetic signatures instruments that we have in the field over the last two years. And these instruments are revenue generating. So we're in a very nice position where we have a much broader install base given our recent success over the last, well, our success over the last two years. And that success is really reflected in our increasing revenue, which on the next slide I can, I can take you through, where you can really see that revenue growth that we've had. We recently reported 9.4 million in revenue in the last quarter alone, you can see that in the last column, and 21.8 21 million in the half of this year. So that's more than four and a half times our entire annual revenue in FY19, and that's just in the last six months um, of this financial year. We're certainly now in expansion phase. We are focused on Europe and the US and we have international sales team who have already had success signing up customers for our tests, not only for COVID tests, but for full respiratory screening as well as our enteric range of kits. And this is where it's important to realize that the quadrupling of the instruments that we've had is really a great base that we can continue to support the future growth of, of genetic signatures. We're in a very strong position to execute our expansion plans. So the next slide, I'll go through a little um, more on our PNL for the half year. We did report a 4.7 million profit for the half year. And it's important because this is while we were growing and expanding the business. So we've made extra, we've made investments in personnel, extra personnel, particularly overseas, into clinical trials to support new product registrations as they come through. We've invested in new instruments and we've invested in new technology. So while we responded quickly to the emergence of COVID, SARS-CoV-2, we gained many new customers. But it's really important to remember here that genetic signatures produces many tests in addition to a COVID test. And that the next slide will detail those tests that we have. The majority of our revenue came from our two most mature products, and they're the enteric and the respiratory screening kits. They're right up there on the top. They have TGA and CIVD accreditation. We're also seeking FDA clearance for our enteric protozoan kit, which is currently at the trial stage, which will give us clearance to sell into the US. The key here for me, or from a revenue point of view, is that there are seven additional products that have some regulatory registrations or are coming through the development pathway or commercialization pathways. And these will all be revenue generating and they all work in exactly the same way with many compatible instruments that are already in the field. So we've shifted our focus now, we're well and truly focused on beyond COVID and the next slide will show you the potential of, of one of the kits I've mentioned. This is our enteric protozoan kit where in the US we're doing trials to support an FDA clearance. And we do believe that our product will displace traditional testing for parasite detection. The traditional test is looking down a microscope and identifying you know, micro uh, protozoan cysts. We know there are five and a half million of these traditional tests that are done in the US each year. We know they're labor intensive, they require trained technicians, they have seven day plus turnaround times and they're quite insensitive, sometimes 50% sensitivity. Whereas we have a, a comprehensive molecular product, it can identify eight of the most common protozoan infections in just a few hours. And we're aiming to win 40% market share over the next five years. And that's roughly 2 million tests per annum. We know there are existing reimbursements of 260 US dollars. So this single product in the US alone has the potential to generate tens of millions in annual revenue for us. And it's obviously that reason that we're very excited to finish the trials and submit our application to the FDA as soon as possible. It's certainly part of our strategy 
looking forward in a post-COVID era where, where we have new products coming through. And on the next slide, I'll focus on looking beyond COVID, where we are already leveraging the gains that we've made in the last two years. So we do have an established direct sales force in Europe and in the US. We also use distributors in Europe. We're targeting those newly acquired customers with the other approved tests that we had before the pandemic, and that includes non-respiratory targets. So we actually have five ad additional kits. They have regulatory clearance. We can offer those to the new customers that we won who are currently only screening for SARS-CoV-2. And of course, we have more kits in development. In terms of product development, we are investing in a next generation instrument. We're excited by that as we do believe it will be a game changer. It will be specific to three base, our technology, and it will be sample to answer. We're working on newer technologies and these technologies will, in, will decrease the time to result even further. And we've recently filed a provisional patent to cover off these new inventions. We, we will continue to progress regulatory submissions. As I outlined, we're developing new kits, which again, will be revenue generating. So I'll wrap it up on the next slide. I'll just summarize the investment opportunity in genetic signatures. Firstly, it's our revenue growth. We have achieved maiden first year profit last financial year. We're profitable in the first half of this year that we just reported. There remain very significant market opportunities for us, particularly in Europe and the US, and combined, they're estimated to be around 70% of the world market. We have invested in product development and expansion as I outlined. And finally, we, re we have a proven business model. We have increased recognition of genetics, genetic signatures and our technology in those much larger international markets. We have a unique technology that was developed in Australia and one that we're exceptionally proud of. I'm happy to pause there for, for any questions. Thank you, John. Uh, bang on time. Um, so this uh, rapid antigen test environment, it's gone from where well, you couldn't get them and you could only buy them at Easy Mark for too much money. And now they kind of flooded the market. At the same extent, the school environment is, is obviously buying a lot of these um, kits. How, how does this impact your business model? How, how have you evolved and how have you operated in this sort of environment? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question, Tim. Um, our, the demand for our tests is, is, is continued into this quarter as we outlined in the last quarterly, even though, as you say, many of the rapid antigen tests are used. But it's, I think it's really important here to recognize that the molecular tests that we make, the PCR tests, the genetic signatures make, are the gold standard test. They do directly detect the genetic information of the organisms. PCR tests are known for their accuracy in terms of sensitivity, in terms of specificity. And we have, you know, PCR tests are about 99% sensitive. Rapid antigen tests are 85%, you know, some are greater, but, you know, I just saw one the other day that said highly sensitive, positive result within seven days of symptoms. You know, at that point, you've infected a lot of people. Um, the current usage of the rapid antigen tests, I believe it's just a Band-Aid. They're not regulated. Nobody you know, nobody watches you on how you perform the test, how you stored the test, how you took the swab, which is the most important part. As I said, I think a Band-Aid so solution at best, the market will return to the gold standard. And the, particularly as we're going to move into winter here, we will see a return of influenza. We will see other targets coming from the Northern Hemisphere. We know swine flu is currently in Europe and the borders are open and they will make their way down here like they have every other year. Rhino will be circulating, RSV will be circulating. A rapid antigen test cannot test for all of these things together. They just can't do it. So it will change where you have symptoms and being tested for SARS-CoV-2 alone is no longer sufficient. You know, our type of test that can test for that, flu, RSV, rhino, in addition to COVID is exactly what we need and we're ready, ready to go. And, and there's a common question here, like what, what proportion or percentage of your revenue actually came from COVID testing um, over the last 12 months? 
look, the majority came from, from respiratory enteric. They are the two most mature products. Um, and, and, and certainly when we have outbreaks or new waves of infection, you know, our, our, our revenue from COVID only goes up. But our strategy is to convert all of those COVID only tests back into multiplex screening. And this is already happening. We have examples in Australia and in Europe, in, in, in the UK, where, where customers that came on only looking for SARS-CoV-2 have expanded into the full respiratory screen. And that's really important because we know there are other tests that are, that are circulating. So we do, we do expect a return uh, where we see the gastroenteritis um, revenue increase back to pre-pandemic levels. In fact, they've already returned. Um, depending on the wave and where we are in the world. And we have new placements of those enteric kits in, in Europe uh, and, in, and in the UK. Um, so we certainly uh, will ex we'll, we'll expect a rebalancing as the world shifts away from COVID only testing back into sort of the most modern test you can get, which is multiplexed PCR testing. And, and post this COVID environment, um... Uh, what's the biggest opportunity for genetic signatures? Is it uh, do you do you look at addressing a disease first, or do you look at kind of the market opportunity? Look, we, we we do look at both. Some some disease opportunities are very underserved, and some um, you know we, we we have a great solution. I mean, I, I mentioned gastroenteritis testing. That's an approved kit. It's still largely done via traditional methods in Europe and in, in the US. Um, and Australia has been an early adopter for these molecular tests. So I expect the other countries to, to, to follow suit. Um, we have tests that can identify antimicrobial anti resistance. These are the superbugs, antibiotic resistance. And I'm excited by that opportunity. We know that by the year 2050, there's, that there are going to be more deaths than cancer. We know currently that one person dies every 15 minutes in the US because of an antibiotic resistant bacterial infection. And we have more coming through the regulatory process. Enteric protozoan I talked about. I'm absolutely excited by that and what we can do in the US with a molecular test like that. We have an STI product, which we're putting through regulatory uh, processes here in Australia. That's almost a $2 billion you know, annual market. So uh, you know, our strategy, I think, is very clear that we're going to add more customers. We're going to add more testing targets. And, and ultimately, we will build shareholder value. And, and just on that, and we'll just finish on that, Chef. The share price has been disappointing, I suppose, given the environment you've been in, and your financials are strong. Cash, profitable, a uh, strong institutional register around 30%. But what's the market missing here? Well, I, it's very hard to comment on the market, Tim. I'll always get it wrong. Um, <laughs> I think I think some people may have interpreted that, that we are a new company and that we're doing COVID-only testing. And uh, I think once they realise the depth to what we have, we are a 20-year-old company. We have, you know, we have Nobel laureates as, as uh, on our scientific advisory board. Um, you know, there is a much depth to our, our company. We have many more projects to uh, to develop. We haven't even gotten onto the um, cancer detection uh, type of product, which molecular diagnostics uh, are able to do. And we have a very strong position there given our three base technology. So I think, you know, there's the <laughs> could speculate for a long time, Tim, but I think that I think that um, when you have a look, certainly the pandemic has given us some things we can point to. There are some acquisitions were made in Europe for companies very similar to ours that got 19 times their 12 month revenue. Uh, if you look at them as a comparable, then uh, I think the only conclusion you can come to is we are undervalued. John, thanks for your time. Um, have a nice week. And there's, there's another three or four questions here. If, if you don't mind, if you have time, um, you can type the answers directly. Otherwise, I'll send them to you um, over the weekend. Um, I'm, I'm happy to jump on and type some answers. No problem, Tim. Right. Have a good thanks, weekend. John. Okay, see you, mate. Um, next, next, back, we, uh, next up, we welcome back Little Green Farmer, ASX code LGP, market cap around 130 million. Stocks had a one-year return of minus 20% or so. Um, the company is the leading Australian medicinal cannabis um, company uh, with the first locally produced product available now for approved patients. We have with us uh, Fleeta Solomon, who is the Managing Director. Over to you, Fleeta. Thanks, Tim. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Um, yes, my name is Fleeta. I'm the CEO of Little Green Pharma. And we are all about doing extraordinary things for patients across the globe through the production of cannabis-based medicines. And that's both here in Australia and in Denmark in Europe. 
Um, so if we flick to the corporate overview slide, we have some of the biggest shareholder names in Australia on our register. And this includes a Hancock Prospecting and Thorny Group Australia. And they've both been really loyal backers um, along with other groups as well. I also want to mention on this slide um, that Angus Caithness and I, we're both executive directors and between us uh, own about 10% of the company. So shareholders can be really comfortable that we think like investors, we're not just management. And I think that's a really important point to get across. Uh, currently, we have about uh, 25 million in cash reserves from the end of December. The market cap is around 130 million mark. So an excellent buy given our strategic positioning in the international medicinal cannabis space and recent performance in Australia. We go on to the investment highlights, um, just to very briefly and simply put, Little Green Pharma is extremely well positioned to supply a high grade pharmaceutical medicines across the globe. And we aim to be a leader across Europe as well. We're the leader here in Australia. Um, we've got the premier brand. We were the first to produce cannabis medicines back in 2018, and we've been exporting overseas now for several years. Uh, we're vertically integrated with world-class production facilities in Australia and Denmark, and this provides us with great geographical advantages. Um, both of the facilities are EU GMP compliant, and this stands for good manufacturing practice and is a prerequisite to sell into many countries overseas. And there's actually only a handful of companies uh, across the world that actually have this capability that can actually deliver. And uh, we just won an Italian tender last night, and I'll get to that a little bit um, later in the presentation, but that's thanks to this EU GMP certification we have. Um, we've got an incredibly dominant positioning in the EU now. Um, we've got strategic supply pathways into several of the EU countries with emerging medicinal cannabis regimes. And that total addressable market is about the $37 billion mark. Uh, so we've got strong product innovation and R&D pipeline through a meet the market and a lead the market strategy. So we're very well primed and positioned for uh, the industry as it progresses. On the business model slide, um, I'm actually uh, one more thank you. I'm not going to go through this. I wanted to put it on the slide and on the screen so you can refer back to it. Um, but it essentially it demonstrates a vertically integrated business model, which we operate. And we love this because we can ensure that we're across um, all of the activities in the value chain and we've got complete control. And of course, we're always after ways we can uh, create value. So importantly, we're not only growers of medicinal cannabis plants, but we also manufacture them into those final medicines and we have distribution and sales pipelines uh, across the world, mainly Australia and across Europe. Okay, our growth strategy. So LGP, and um, we'll just move to the next slide. We've got a really clear strategy to achieve our vision. One, patient acquisition in Australia. So sales in Australia, really important for market validity and also for generating immediate cash flow. Two, commercial sales volumes in overseas markets. So this is where we want to focus. This is where we aim to make the profits. This is the big stuff immediately. And our end games are number three, which is unique drug delivery technologies. And this is to solve real patient problems in the longer term. Okay, so we'll move on. So that's our growth strategy. And I want to share with you our capability to be able to deliver on that strategy. So if we go to the next slide and have a look at LGP Australia. Um, so this is in Western Australia. We have an indoor facility. Uh, we have complete control over the life of the cannabis plant. And this facility is capable of producing up to three tonnes of biomass annually. And our facility or our manufacturing facility is TGA GMP licensed. That means because of a mutual recognition agreement with Europe, um, our GMP, so our manufacturing license is compliant with EU, and that is a really huge bonus. Moving to LGP Denmark, uh, so this was a recent acquisition of ours, and it is fabulous. So this 
it's if we look at the, the sheer size of this facility it's insane it's magnificent and has a production capacity of over 20 tons of biomass so compare that to our australian of three tons so it's very large uh, it's also got a really big GMP manufacturing facility and a testing lab on site as well. So it makes it one of the few facilities in Europe. So we're well positioned there. Okay, if we have a look at our track record of patient access in Australia. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. Thank you. We had record half yearly sales revenue of 6.9 million. So this is unaudited, um, but it demonstrates great growth considering the total revenue for financial year 21 was 7 million. And, um, and before that in 20 it was 2.2 million. So we're really happy with the growth and where we're at. Uh, we've got well over 23,000 patients across Australia now, uh, though it is getting harder to track this number, but we estimate this to be about 20% of the market share. If we go on and have a look at the size of the Australian addressable market, so we'll go to the next slide, it's really exciting. Um, a, a recent industry report suggested that the 2022 market revenue forecast in Australia is estimated about 400 million. So that's that's quite huge. And Canaccord Genuity last year predicted the market at maturity could reach about one billion dollars. So. Um, and our, and our patient numbers are climbing as well. Uh, the Australian demand continues to grow. The Therapeutic Goods Administration approved over 200,000 SASB uh, script applications to date. So that gives you a really good indication of the trajectory and the, um, and, and the increasing demand and the acceptance of medicinal cannabis, which is so important. So with all of this and our market share, um, I have to say LGP's future is very bright for the Australian domestic market. Okay, let's move on to the EU distribution because this is where it starts to get really exciting and this is the market that we want to be. So the clear message here is to demonstrate our dominant and strategic positioning across Europe. If we have a look at EU and the UK population, uh, so we'll exclude Russia in this, it's about 515 million people. So the LGP's total addressable market, that is the countries in which we're strategically located or currently selling in has a population of 350 million or estimated at 37 billion at maturity. So I guess the significance of this is the EU market is much bigger than, say, the Canadian markets and also bigger than the US markets. And so what's interesting is that very few North American companies actually have that manufacturing license or capability I just previously spoke about, nor the knowledge or the licensing to enter the European market. So this is really attractive for LGP because it sets us apart on the world stage and we have really prime positioning. Um, so if we just have a look at a few of those countries, uh, the dark green countries on your slide, yep, thank you, um, is where we're currently selling in. So Denmark, first of all, we have a facility here. We have Denmark's first locally produced cannabis medicine registered, and we've got really encouraging first sales in January. So we are known as a company of firsts. We're the first in Australia. Now we're the first in Denmark. Um, and we were, you know, one of the first as well into Germany, the third to have oil medicines there. So the Germany and UK markets are really a, a big markets, and we have strong distribution partners there. What's interesting with Germany um, is Germany looks like legalizing cannabis for adult use in the next year or two. So it's highly likely that they will require high grade EU GMP cannabis uh, products or raw biomass. So that means Little Green Farmer is optimally positioned. And again, one of the few companies that can produce and uh, meet these requirements. The light green coloured countries that you can see, I'm just going to spend a bit more time. This is such an important slide because it's our, it's really what we're targeting right now. Um, these are the countries where we're strategically located to capture market share as those countries open up. These, these are really exciting because they're harder to get into and it makes them uh, more lucrative or potentially more lucrative for LGP. So in France, 
LGP is one of only four suppliers uh, participating in a, in a government trial that's currently being run at the moment. We've shipped more than 23,000 units of cannabis medicines to the country. And this has a value of about 2.7 million. Um, although we won't be recognising this as revenue because it's a study that's being done, but it's nice to know, um, you know what that value is. We've only got less than a year to run on that trial. And we really believe that LGP is set to capitalise on its brand equity and first mover advantage in that country. So one to, to listen out for and look at, um, we, we, exciting for us and our position. Italy, overnight, LGP has been uh, pre-qualified by the Italian government and we actually won the tender. So we are one of only a few or a handful of companies ever to be um, uh, allowed to supply into Italy. So a huge market. So the overriding message here is that if we can capture market share overseas due to our first mover advantage and establishment of brand equity, just like we've done in Australia, then we'll really be delivering on that strategy across Europe. So very exciting. Um, great, we'll move on and just to touch on our product innovation strategy. So on the next slide there, we have a, um, a meet the market and a lead the market strategy. Our meet the market strategy is about solving patient problems now and in the short term. So we currently have nine oil and flour medicines which patients are accessing and we currently have two new medicines, or sorry, about to be launched. And we have two new dosage forms currently in development to solve unmet clinical needs. On our lead the market strategy, this looks at the longer term drug registration process, uh, which may encompass drug formulation and or delivery technologies to again um, solve unmet needs. So this is where we really want to be in the future. It'll give us differentiation. It'll create protectable IP. So really meaningful position, not just the market share and brand equity that we've got now. Uh, so let's go and uh, we'll just summarise. So on the next, sli uh, the next slide, thank you. And just to close, so why LGP? First of all, our capacity to deliver through our vertically integrated business model, um, our geographical footprint and infrastructure to supply medicines across Australia and Europe. You actually just can't beat our positioning. The market opportunity available to us, it's huge. And finally, our track record of execution we're known for hitting our milestones and we're not going to stop now. Um, so really, that's it. Uh, thanks, everyone. Open to questions. And of course, my contact details are on the last slide. If you'd like to reach out, I always love hearing from you. So um, uh, thanks, Tim. Back to you and open to questions. Thanks, Fleda. Always a very impressive presentation from you. Thank you. Um, now, quickly, is were there any um, supply chain issues or is there any inflation in the supply chain, given you're in the manufacturing business? Oh, look, yes, definitely. We learnt early on, we were actually fortunate um, being in Australia, we were a little bit protected initially with COVID, if that's what you were referring to. Uh, we were able to learn pretty quickly that others in Europe were going to struggle. Um, the benefit, I guess, of being vertically integrated is that we have that supply chain covered. So we were able to do things like Let's make sure we've got extra bottles and packaging at our at our hands, so ready, you know, ready and easy to go. So, we look. Logistics have definitely caused a little bit of an issue, just in terms of flights out of Perth in Western Australia, for example, don't happen every day these days. And so, instead of being able to have product within a, into a country within 24, 48 hours, it can be sort of 72 hours to a few days. So, um, they're the kind of differences that we're seeing, but they don't certainly don't make or break. Um, and we've been able to manage those in any any logistical issues that we've had. We've been able to manage so no dramas there and and you, you've got a very strong cash position i think it was 25 million dollars you own your uh, manufacturing facilities in in denmark and europe's the target so is there any plans to build some further manufacturing into italy for example where you've just been licensed is that part of the the future in terms of, of how you operate so we don't need to buy any more cultivation or manufacturing at this point in time. The idea is that Australian operations will eventually look after the Australasia or Oceania countries, whereas uh, our Danish facility will look after Europe. So like Italy was a really important one overnight because their 
the entry, the barriers to entry in that country are very high. You know, you have to be EU GMP. So you have to have that manufacturing license and you have to be in Europe. So Denmark is so important to us and our future because that facility is where a lot of the future medicines for all of Europe will come from. So fortunately with Italy, we don't have to be there per se, as in we don't have to manufacture or produce. Um, our Danish facility will do that. And that's the benefit of the EU countries and how they work together. And, and we'll just finish on a big question here. I, I use um, cannabis oil to help me sleep. And I've always got friends saying, where can I get it? So how, how does this market gain wide attraction? And, and let's talk about Australia, for example, we've got 23,000 patients and a big market and obviously same in Europe. How do you, how does this become mainstream? Look, it is, yeah, it's a, oh, it's a tough question. It's so complex. We could pick that apart and be here forever. Uh, Australia's regime is a little bit different to that of other countries. At the moment, we still need to go to a doctor to get a script, generally speaking, for, the, for medicinal cannabis. Um, recently, legislation did change to allow CBD to be over the counter in pharmacies. However, it will be some time before we actually see product sitting on a pharmacy shelf. And the reason for that is because it's going to be readily available, the TGA need to make sure that it's really safe and efficacious. So what it says on the label is, is somewhat true, and so but mainly on that safety aspect. And that takes years. You know, you have to do clinical trials. This costs millions of dollars and years. Um, it's not so, it's not as long as a product, like a medicinal product registration that can take four or five years and, and almost a billion dollars for some uh, companies. So it is a process, but we are getting there. And just with the sheer volume of doctors who are now prescribing cannabis medicines, there are literally thousands of them across uh, Australia who are very open and are actively uh, prescribing cannabis medicine. So every single day, we're getting more and more people become um, aware of medicinal cannabis. It is mainstream. It is here to stay. And some of the results, we've just published a um, some results ourselves. We did a study on pain using one of our products and really promising results. And uh, yeah, look, so with all of these evidence-based uh, observational studies and the trials that are going to be concluding soon, the evidence is building all the time. So really exciting for this industry. Thanks, Fleta. A big market and a big opportunity. Um, nice to see you again. Thank you. Okay, next up, we have RAS Technology Holdings, ASX code RTH, market cap of around $50 million. I think the company listed just late last year. Uh, the company is a leading provider of fully integrated premium data, enhanced content and software as a solution uh, services to the global racing and waging industries. Looks really interesting. We have with us the CEO, Stephen Crisp. Stephen, over to you, mate. Thanks very much, Tim, and thanks to Share Cafe for the opportunity to talk about Raz Technology Holdings uh, today, which is the owner of Racing and Sports. Uh, we're newly listed as of uh, November last year, and this is um, uh, obviously a new environment for us to be operating in, but it really does help fuel our global ambitions uh, and plans for expansion of the company into uh, particularly the US uh, and uh, parts of UK and Europe as well. So we'll flip through to the Racing Sports Overview slide to get started. Uh, well, racing in sports has been around for over 20 years. Um, it's uh, a data technology and digital company uh, primarily. However, it's been innovating and developing uh, in that time to cover uh, wagering operators, rights holders, private and retail customers and racing bodies. Uh, we're well respected in the industry, having been around uh, for such a long time. We've built up strong relationships and we'll see some of those, those key customers uh, later on in the slide deck. Um, Racing Sports provides premium data, enhanced content, uh, analytics, uh, predictive analytics as well uh, for wagering customers. And these are uh, primarily referred to as the best in the industry. Um, we have customers all over the world. And you can see in the top right hand corner there some of our key customers. And a lot of those have been with us for you know, many years, something uh, over 10 years in some cases. So a very loyal and sticky customer base uh, built up over that time. For you know, the data and technology that we provide, the industry is, is really second to none. Uh, there's been significant IP built up over the past 20 years as well, which has also led to the position where we are today to really commercialise that on a global stage as the wagering industry globally takes shape. 
and we're seeing that in the US, uh, particularly with um, you know with the advent of fixed odds uh, coming online over the next few years, as well as um, you know the market generally starting to pick up for uh, pari mutual wagering in, in that market as well. Uh, Racing Sports is headquartered in Canberra. We have a UK office and a team over there that we're building. We have a support and tech office in Colombo and Sri Lanka, as well as the US operations, which are scheduled for this year, which are well in hand. Let's jump to the next slide for our capability overview. Uh, so the Racing Sports has five key business lines, uh, as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen there. Wholesale data content distribution is probably the most uh, long-standing part of the business, which really goes to our enhanced content, the uh, predictive analytics uh, and the core service we provide to wagering operators. So we provide all of the information content statistics that they uh, actually present on their websites. So it's a B2B service we provide. Uh, and as you can imagine, a highly, um, uh, it's a core service for these operators uh, to actually run their businesses. So a really um, great place for racing sports to be a trusted provider in that regard and also gives us the ability to innovate um, and, uh, and create solutions, information, data, content solutions for those customers. Wagering technology and services is probably the newest part of the racing sports business, being really around two to two and a half years where we've been entering into the trading uh, and pricing space. And that really goes for our, our trading manager and pricing manager solution and that um, yeah, we've had great success in a very short amount of time uh, with clients here in Australia as well as overseas in the UK um, and the US as well so that's continued to expand and, uh, and a really exciting place racing sports to be in that wagering tech, tech space. There are other products we're also innovating on and developing which will be due for launch in 2022 this year which is really exciting and they're things uh, yeah, easy better, uh, pro better, the white label wagering platform and, uh, and more to come. Specialist data services is really our uh, specialist um, high quality uh, analytics based products for specialist customers uh, and private retail customers as well. So it's a, a growing part of the business for people looking for high quality information that we provide. And then the digital media side of the business, we're very well known for the racingsports.com uh, website. We've been uh, operating that for 20 years. It, is, uh, it has over 2 million unique viewers every year and that's growing as well as over 40 million page views. So it's a really substantial uh, digital asset and we've got um, a lot of ambition to actually grow that internationally now across different jurisdictions and different geographical regions uh, to help cross promote um, our customers' interests, but also the interests of racing and sports. Let's jump into the next slide. The company highlights, and we've touched on a few of these already, but racing and sports has significant global coverage. We have a database uh, containing over 30 countries of comprehensive racing information, uh, as well as um, spanning over 20 years of that, of that information. Now that's significant because it, that actually helps us drive uh, and, and innovate uh, and create those predictive analytics based on uh, historical information, uh, as well as producing um, the high quality information we provide to our, our wagering operators uh, as customers as well. So the database is something we own. We've built that up over 20 years. It is the most trusted and most comprehensive um, source of, of racing data anywhere you'll find in the world. Uh, and we certainly um, hold that very close to our, our DNA. It's the core of our business. It's how we do what we do and create those uh, wonderful analytics and visualizations that our customers use. The strong domestic presence and reputation of the company, racing sports is well known uh, for, uh, to be a leader in the industry. Um, the, the relationships and reputation have been built up over that 20 year period uh, and we continue to, to enjoy that trust um, you know, from our clients today in the market. Uh, we're well positioned as, a, um, as an essential service provider um, and we have a, um, a high degree of uh, enterprise customers and no churn. So that really says a lot about the, the company's profile in terms of looking after our customers and the ability to upsell and grow with them as they change uh, their businesses as well. So a really fortunate position for racing sports to be in and something that we take very seriously. Uh, and also the ability for us to scale and convert our products into key territories around the world. So Racing Sports is a, an expert at con uh, converting uh, content, data, and leaks uh, into uh, regionalized formats for different markets. So that might be the US market, the UK, Europe, um, even internationally, we have a, a Chinese translated version of the Racing Sports website, as well as Chinese translated versions of our products. And we're currently working on other translations into other countries um, uh, uh, formats as well. So that's an exciting place for us to be and these things are constantly evolving as uh, demand increases for different products from around the world. And our partner arrangements, Racing Sports has got some great partners around the world and is uh, in the process of forming some new ones uh, uh, presently, which we'll speak about uh, hopefully in the coming days and weeks, uh, which are quite exciting for the, uh, the expansion of the growth of the company. Uh, let's go to the next slide. 
So the key performance metrics of the company, um, look, you can see that from 20 to 21, uh, we've had a 39% increase um, on pro forma uh, revenue, which is a fantastic result and certainly a trend that we've continued to see. Um, this is really driven by new customer contracts of around a million dollars uh, and expanded services um, of enterprise customers um, of around half a million dollars. So it's been really exciting to, uh, to see that growth. Um, and half of the customers um, relate to the trading manager platform, which is a new wagering technology um, uh, side of the business. Uh, which is very pleasing. So, uh, and that continues uh, to to have increased um, uh, uptick in the business uh, even today, which is wonderful. Um, you can see the um, the EBITDA um, shows significant growth up to 1.4 million in FY21, um, and that's also been driven through the flow-on effects of increased revenues, maintaining um, you know tight operating expenditure um, throughout the back half of last year and also into this year as well. Um, we've um, yeah, we've made. We've had a lot of automation, a lot of uh, intelligence baked into the processing frameworks and the way we conduct the business. And that's also enabled us to scale and grow the business effectively and efficiently as well from a cost uh, perspective. And also the AMRR, pleasingly. Um, the uh, AMRR has you know, increased by 75% to 6.6 .6 million for the June uh, 21 period. Uh, and it's continued to grow in the first quarter of 2022 with an additional 1.4. Um, being a 20% result from increase on June. So really uh, pleasing for the business of, of our size to be growing so um, you know, consistently and really goes to, uh, to uh, yeah, as a result of all those characteristics of the company that I've spoken about before, the long tenure, 20 year plus uh, tenure in the industry, trusted relationships and ability to, um, to upsell and infiltrate um, with those customers into new geographic markets uh, as well so as a trusted provider for them. Uh, let's hop on to the next slide. Yep. And the next, yep. the key customers by segment. So you can see there's some pretty big name brands. This really breaks them up in terms of racing and sports as business lines. So you can see the, the center box there, wholesale data content distribution is by far the biggest part of the business. Um, and this is really where these companies and more rely on the racing and sports, um, enhanced information, enhanced content, analytics, uh, predictive um, algorithms to provide them with the data that they then provide to their customers. So it's a really essential B2B service, uh, long-standing customers, recurring uh, contracts, uh, a really good place for racing sports to be. And again, a service we take very seriously to make sure we are the best um, in the industry, in the world at providing content. And I think, um, you know, by and large, you ask anybody in the industry and they will know that racing sports services, uh, majority of these companies uh, provides the content that they use uh, for their daily operations. Wagering technology and services, uh, again, the growing part of the business, we've got a couple of big names there and they're expanding um, as we um, see it today into, uh, into new customer segments, both here in Australia, but also in the UK and the US, uh, which is pleasing. Uh, and digital and media, again, just touching on that, we've, we've been around a long time in the digital and media space uh, and that part of the business is, is set for a, um, a big year in 2022 with some uh, exciting um, growth into, into international markets for digital and media and, um, and content. So next slide. Um, custom milestones, you'll see um, going back to the year 2000, um, starting with Timeform and then the uptick of customers through that time. And you'll, and you'll see the ramp up from around 2015, 2016, when um, online wagering really became um, you know, prominent um, in Australia, but also globally. Uh, and you can see the uptick has been fairly consistent for racing and sports to acquire new customers, uh, big names, and hang on to those customers, um, often upselling additional uh, services and content and data and technology services. Uh, to those customers as well. So really pleasing um, long-term track record. Uh, this industry is really based around trust and, and ability to deliver. And that's not just the um, Australian or Australasian market, it's also the global markets as well. So uh, racing sports is well positioned to continue the trend of customer acquisition um, as we um, continue to, to push into international markets. Uh, next slide. Uh, this slide's a really good one. It actually just gives you a good overview of how big the wagering market is globally. Uh, and you can see there, Australia's um, down the bottom um, and it's, uh, it's quite a mature wagering market. So um, you know, with that regard, it's actually uh, quite a, um, a good benchmark, I guess, um, for the rest of the world. Um, and you look at the US with the, uh, the population size, yet the wagering turnover is actually quite a lot lower. Therefore, you know, um, you can extrapolate the size market there will only continue to grow and racing and sports is making big inroads into the US market from a content data analytics uh, and also a fixed odds perspective. Uh, presently, we're working with XBNet for the export of US racing and fixed odds um, exclusively into Australia and New Zealand and also work with a partner for the distribution of that into the US as well. So it's a big, a big market for us to be playing and we cover all of US racing as it stands today. 
uh, and the domestic market is only continuing to evolve. So when that, um, that continues to mature, we'll be perfectly placed to take advantage of that. Uh, to the next slide. Now, the globalization of racing is happening. Um, we have, a, as I said, a comprehensive database of racing information, harness, um, thoroughbred and, um, and greyhounds. Uh, and that obviously leads us to be able to convert product into any regional or geographic format that we need to, to sell into wagering operators and support the growth of the wagering industry as a global product. Uh, and this is really important because uh, all these countries are looking to export their racing product into time zones that can actually take and participate on, on converting into wagering turnover and racing sports is a key enabler of that, of that process. So really important to note there. Uh, jump onto the next slide. Uh, the revenue model, so the majority of our revenue is recurring revenue streams, uh, which is uh, obviously pleasing and uh, they're very sticky clients, uh, multi-year contracts that keep on recurring. So a really fortunate place for racing sports to be and um, it just goes to show that 75% AMRR um, increase year on year for 2021. So uh, and a trend we're seeing you know, continue as, uh, particularly as uh, your racing sports starts to uh, get a footprint in those new geographical regions. Uh, jump onto the next slide. Uh, the expansion plans of racing in sports. So internationally, we're looking at the US, the UK and Europe um, and continuing to service our clients in Australia uh, and enter into new markets here with our wagering technology. A really exciting place for the company to be. Uh, sports is a new frontier for us as a company. We have a lot of analytics and processing frameworks that we've built up um, specifically to take on sports and uh, provide the same sort of analytics we've been doing for racing. So this process has already started. And that's, a, and that's a several pronged process about the analytics, the data, uh, also the, um, the editorial and digital and media side of, uh, of that process as well. So we're actually fusing all of that together to create a, uh, a new product, which I think will be um, exciting for our customers um, in a B2B, but also a B2C sense from our digital assets. So that's something in 2022 to watch out for and something we're really excited about. Uh, and also acquisitions, you know, we're looking for companies that actually fit um, our expansion and our growth plans from a technology, a data, and also a market positioning perspective. So um, again, you know, opportunity to find companies and work with companies um, is already underway. So jump on to the next slide. And these are some of the products that we're pushing um, into market at the moment. The trading manager is already uh, available and working uh, with customers Australia, uh, UK and the US. Uh, the white label wager platform, Easy Better and Oddsgrid are all due for 2022. Uh, and they're really going to change, uh, we believe, the market and the way that um, customers interact with um, with wagering operators, uh, you know, for the better. So it'll be an exciting year ahead, lots of ambition and uh, lots of um, IP built into these uh, products and, uh, and services for the market. We'll jump on to the next slide. Uh, we've already touched on the financials, so we, I think we're running short on time, so we might skip over this one as well. And, uh, and look, just the uh, the board and the executive team, so with a lot of pedigree in the, in the racing industry, uh, from Gary Crisp, who's been in the industry for you know, 35, 40 years and uh, has an impeccable track record. Myself, uh, Stephen Crisp, I've been in racing and sports for over 20 years. Uh, Andrew Burns, the Chief Financial Officer uh, with significant ASX experience. Robert Bukaitis, our CTO, uh, who is the Chief Innovator of, uh, you know, of the technology and, and solutions that we push into market, which is uh, you know, a testament to his um, ability. And Brent Dolan in the UK, so he's been leading the charge on the Northern Hemisphere. And we're building a team around Brent, uh, which is exciting for us. And we have a great board as well on the next slide. Uh, and you can read through some of their bios, but they are a high powered board uh, and they're a great uh, benchmark for the business to, to grow from. And with that, I'll hand over to, to you, Tim. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Um, almost out of time, but a couple of quick questions. We did our research in the background and um, there's been a lot of uh, M&A in this kind of sports data area. Uh, Genius Sports, which supplies NFL data, just sold to one for 1.5 billion to a tech company in, in the US. I think it's listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, so for you specializing in uh, racing, who, who should come uh, international competition and is there room for further consolidation? Uh, look, I think there is room for consolidation in the wagering um, sector. and We've already seen significant consolidation within Australia from wagering operators. Uh, in terms of data, content and, um, and digital, there re really is no natural competitor for racing sports in the market. We have significant digital reach through our media assets. We control uh, and offer the, uh, the you know, newswire assets today. We, we work with race clubs here in Australia for uh, actually providing them their media coverage that then they push out into mainstream media. Uh, and also the digital enhanced um, content we provide as a B2B service to our customers as well. No one has, uh, has the analytics, the predictive models, the ability to compare races from anywhere in the world against each other, compare horses from anywhere in the world against each other and come up with those predictive models 
Um, so we really are in a very unique position uh, for a global perspective for the racing um, service and also pushing that into sports as well. And, and it must be a hell of a process to collect all this data. So if you're talking to someone like Bluebet, what, what is the actual data from a practical sense uh, you're giving back to them? Is it the, the jockeys, the horse weight, the results, all that sort of stuff? Yeah. So it's, yeah, enhanced, in, enhanced predictive uh, comments and verdicts, uh, one of the products that we provide them, which are those. Uh, so essentially when you read, if you go to a, a bookie's website, Bluebet, for example, and you read the comments, uh, you have know, the uh, free horse each runner, each race, we provide all of those uh, using, um, but they're all based out of uh, the database. They're generated through a process that takes several hours to run up actually for every meeting because every uh, every operator gets a, a customised set to them. Uh, and that provides the analytics, um, the five-star form um, and the predictive ratings that, uh, that they use to actually um, assess a horse. So when a customer goes there, you want to give your customers the best chance of winning. Uh, that's the aim of the game. So participate and um, feel like they've got an opportunity to have fun and engage. Thanks, Stephen. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. There's another question online. If you have time to answer it, that'd be great. Otherwise, um, we'll follow your progress and reach out to have you on uh, later in the year. Thanks so much, Tim. I appreciate the time and opportunity to be on Share Cafe. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, next up, we have Aravella Therapeutics, ASX code ALA, market cap around $26 million, one year return of around minus 15%. The company develops products and acquires additional platforms that have an impact on the treatment of cancer and conditions that affect the central nervous system. We have with us the CEO and Managing Director, Dr. Michael Baker. Michael, thanks for your time. Over to you. Wonderful. Thanks, Tim. And thanks very much to Share Cafe for putting on the event. And thanks to everybody uh, for dialing in and taking the time to listen to us today. And I'm very excited to tell you about Aravella Therapeutics, uh, where we are, but certainly where we see ourselves uh, moving forward. Uh, if you just move to the next slide and the next one, great. So Aravella is a, a biotechnology company. And so what that means is we're committed to helping people live longer and healthier lives. And to do that, uh, we're working on creating really groundbreaking technologies that we think can have a big difference uh, in this space, in particular for the, the conditions Tim just mentioned, oncology, but also conditions that affect the central nervous system. And the key guiding principles for us, uh, we are patient centric, we're data driven and milestone focused. Uh, we are accountable, honest, and we act with integrity. And certainly for this space, uh, drug development, it is, it is difficult. So we need to be persistent and really take and never give up attitude. Next slide, please. And in terms of the company overview, so we, as Tim mentioned, we're currently valued at about 25.8 million. We don't think that reflects the value of the technologies that we've got in the company. Uh, particularly with an EV of, of 17 million, as well as the, the calibre of the people that we've uh, only recently recruited to the team. As of the end of December, we had about $8.8 .8 million cash in the bank, uh, but we are in the, in the process of uh, finalising a, a fully underwritten $1.5 million SPP. And in terms of our shareholders, we just completed a placement uh, at the beginning of the year, and we're delighted to have uh, a well-known investor in this space, Merchant, join our register. So they've had a number of successes in biotech companies, uh, but importantly for us, they understand the investment horizon and of course the, the risks, but also the returns that can come with investments in this space. And we're also pleased that we've got a number of, again, sticky institutional and, and, uh, and high net worth individuals at the top end of the register. Next slide, please. So in terms of our major focus area cancer, I think it's pretty clear to say that it, it is and continues to be a major health issue. And it's, I don't think we'd find too many people in the world that uh, haven't been infect, affected in some way by this disease. And that's really primarily because of the, the, the prevalence. And, and we saw in 2020, there was approximately 19.3 million new cancer cases. Uh, in 2020 alone as well, there's about close to 10 million deaths reported. And for the space that we're working in, it's what we call a type of therapy is known as a biologic. And that market's expected to reach 143 billion or so by 2026. So it's still, in terms of a, a disease area, it's enormous. And of course, as a market, it's also equally the same. Next slide, please. And even more specifically, the type of therapy that we're developing at Aravella, it's what we call a cell therapy. And they have really revolutionized the way we think about cancer treatment. And largely that's off the back of the impressive cure rates that we've seen from these types of technologies and as of February 2022 so this year there's only five approved what we call CAR-T products 
uh, and they're now approved to treat a number of different blood types of blood cancers. And just looking over on to the right hand side, it was only last week or so that there was a recent article that actually reported on the, the patients that were included in the early uh, development research stage of these types of therapies. And it's quite remarkable that 10 years on, uh, some of these patients that had a particular form of leukemia are still cancer free. And so that's, that's why we're particularly excited because cure is a lovely word to be using uh, when we think about cancer treatment and not something we use terribly often. Next slide, please. And so just to give you an overview of what this therapy looks like um, and how it works, we actually, I've, I've depicted it in this little circle over here on the right. Uh, we start with, for the all the approved therapies, we start with a patient and actually collect their blood. The immune cells are taken and those immune cells going over to step two, uh, they what we call genetically reprogrammed to produce what's called a chimeric antigen receptor or CAR for short. And that's indicated by the little red uh, markers on the surface that actually enables those immune cells to, to go into the body and target a particular form of cancer that we tell it to and trigger its destruction. And so at stage three, the cancer cells are grown up into much larger numbers and then they're given back to that particular patient in order for the therapy to do what it needs to do. Now, what's unique about our therapy is we use what are called INKT cells. So they are different from what's currently approved. And we have two advantages at step one, we don't start with a, a patient sample, we can start with a healthy donor, uh, which gives us a lot more flexibility in how we create the product and significantly improves the supply chain. And then at step four, prior to injection, we'll able, be able to freeze our, our therapy and have it stored in a freezer ready for use for a particular cancer patient. Next slide, please. And just to giving a bit more context on what the INKT cells are. So as I said, if we take a blood sample from a, a, a healthy human, what we have inside that blood sample is a, a range of different immune cells. And I've depicted a few here called macrophages, NK cells or T cells. And of course, the cells that we're working on uh, highlighted in blue, INKT cells. And we can consider those as soldiers of our immune system. Their job is to go around look for things that don't belong and trigger its destruction. So that might be bacteria, it might be COVID. Um, and why we've depicted the INKT cells at the top as an armed soldier is because they are one of the most potent naturally occurring immune cells. They already naturally target and kill cancer cells. And not only that, they actually recruit other immune components once they've started that killing. But as I mentioned before, we can use these cells because they don't cause a condition what's called graft versus host disease, uh, which other immune cells can cause. And that's what enables us to, to be able to give these from a healthy donor uh, to a patient. And importantly, what we've seen for a group of cancers is that when we arm them with the car that I mentioned before, we actually have better activity over the approved therapy. So we're in effect, we're hoping that a more effective product that we can roll out at scale because we've got a better manufacturing process. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of the cell therapy commercial landscape, uh, it's one that has and continues to generate uh, enormous commercial activity. And on the left-hand uh, table there, you can see just a, a snapshot of acquisitions, partnerships and collaborations that have uh, been undertaken in the space, starting with two of the most notable at the top there, uh, Gilead acquiring Kite and Celgene acquiring Juno. Uh, that both of those two, one was 11.9 billion, billion, the other 9 billion. Uh, but all right the way through, we're still continuing to stay throughout uh, 2021, a number of very high value strategic partnerships. And, and again, I think it's still a very exciting space to be a part of, again, largely because of the, the prospects of these types of therapies. And so again, on the right hand side, we've just put a snapshot of capital raises in this space throughout 2021. And it's clear that there's still an enormous appetite for investors to, to uh, be involved in this space. And for this type of therapy, uh, specifically cell and gene therapies, we're expecting that market to be about 12.9 billion by 2026. So it is substantially sized. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned before, there are a number of different immune cells, uh, T cells, NK cells, that have um, also been used for these types of therapies. And when we look at the total number of companies for those two types of therapies, it's in the order of hundreds of companies and hundreds of clinical trials ongoing. And so what I'm depicting here on this slide, it's, it's the INKT cell specific company. 
And as, as of today, we believe there are actually only four companies working on this particular cell platform. So it does put us in a very unique position. And in the last eight or nine months or so, we've seen a fair bit of commercial activity uh, for all of these four companies, ranging from strategic partnerships uh, for a total deal value of 875 million for a peer bio on the far left. They're a preclinical stage company, uh, not expecting to get into the clinic until the end of 2023. So that's when human trials would begin. Uh, Cure were acquired for 185 million total deal value in May last year. And Mink um, recently listed on the NASDAQ raising 40 million with an evaluation of 94 million. And so when we look at Aravella, we licensed our, our INKT cell therapy platform technology from uh, Imperial College London, which is a top 10 university worldwide last year in June. And we also added another monoclonal antibody, which we will use as a car from one of the world's best cancer institutes in the world, the MD Anderson Cancer Center. So we do see that we're quite undervalued relative to our peers. Next slide, please. And really equally important for a, a biotechnology company is having a, a world-class team. And that's what we've assembled again over the last uh, eight or nine months. So our chairman, uh, Paul Hopper, is quite well known in the biotechnology sector in Australia. He currently chairs uh, four ASX listed companies and probably most notable on his record is uh, he guided Viralytics to a $502 million sale to Merck in 2018. Uh, myself, I have a PhD in biochemistry before moving into drug development and venture investing, uh, and then joined Aravala as the CEO in 2020. Uh, now, the next four people we have recruited over the last six to eight months, uh, Dr. Deborah Barton is a non-exec director. She's a medical doctor and oncologist by background. She's currently the chief medical officer of Charisma Therapeutics, uh, and they actually just recently announced a deal with um, Moderna, and that uh, constituted a $45 million upfront payment plus undisclosed milestones. And Dr. Liz Stone on the bottom left, she's also been appointed as a director, formerly a, an assistant professor at, professor at Cornell University uh, before moving into large pharma for clinical development. And now she is a, an executive partner at a well-known biotech specific venture capital fund in the US MPM Capital. Uh, she was also the interim CEO of a company, uh, Semi Therapeutics, that was acquired uh, in 2019 for 950 million US. And our last two um, new appointees, Dr. Sandy Buchanan, she's got more than 20 years of experience manufacturing cell therapies. This is one of the key challenges for the field. So we're delighted to have somebody uh, that's been doing this for the bulk of their career. And Dr. Minnie Barathan, who joined at the beginning of February this year, and we, we were able to get her out of a well-known cell therapy company, Selectus, but she's also had uh, more than 15 years experience in the field of immunology uh, and more than 12 years specifically developing cell therapies. So we're very pleased with the team that we have assembled. Next slide, please. And in terms of our pipeline on the cell therapy side of things, we have two main uh, targets at the moment. The first up the top is ALA 101. Uh, that's in the preclinical stages and it's to treat a form of blood cancer called a lymphoma that produces CD19. And as I said, we've licensed that technology from Imperial College London. And what we're doing at the moment is working through the stages of manufacturing before we can take that into a phase one clinical trial, which is when it first gets used in humans. Uh, for ALA 104, that's the technology that we just acquired from the MD Anderson Cancer Center. It's also in the preclinical stages. And again, we're looking forward to advancing that uh, towards clinical trials. We also have an oral spray platform where we convert drugs from solid dose forms into oral sprays. And our most advanced product in that program uh, is called Zolpimist, which is for short-term insomnia. And we've got two commercial partners, uh, Starter uh, for commercialization in Australia and Teva. And we're expecting that to be commercialized in Australia and potentially Chile in 2022. Next slide, please. And I'll just sum up there. I think, uh, as I said, what we've managed to assemble is a, a world, a, a company that's got world leading partnerships with outstanding uh, research institutes and cancer institutes with Imperial College London and the MD Anderson Cancer Center. That gives us an, an allergenic or an off the shelf platform where we've got now two targets to uh, chase after two blood cancer, two forms of blood cancer and potentially solid tumors. Uh, as a group, we will continue to leverage the ex expertise of the team to source, evaluate and acquire new innovative technologies. As I said, the, the team we've built is world-class and we'll continue to build that out. 
Um, but as an organization, we are very data driven uh, using uh, scientific principles to find the technologies and also the clinical areas where we'll go, we'll move into. Uh, but certainly now we see ourselves sitting in a position where we're the only ASX listed company working with this type of platform, uh, the only company worldwide with a car that we're using to target the DKK1 peptide from MD Anderson Cancer Centre, so that we are positioned nicely for growth. And I'll just uh, pass to the next slide for my contact details, but thanks again to everybody for listening and thanks to Tim and the team at Share Cafe for putting this on. Thanks, Michael. Um, you've got a well-known founder in uh, Paul Hopper. He's uh, a biotech entrepreneur. And as you said, he's uh, got several successes with uh, Viralytics in particular, and he's associated with Imogen, Radio, Radio mm -hmm. Farm, Chimeric, et cetera. So he's got quite a portfolio. What, what role does he play and, and what does he bring to the table? Yeah, so he's, he's our chairman. Uh, and certainly for myself, um, learning from somebody like Paul, uh, and getting access to relationships and networks is, is quite important uh, because we are looking to deal with the best cancer research institutes in the world. And certainly uh, Paul's reputation for a lot of those uh, precedes him. So we've been able to, uh, to work with a lot of those groups and it certainly helps when you've got um, contacts in those institutions already. And you had a slide there where it compared yourself to some of the, the, the ink um, sort of biotech companies. Where are they in terms of their development relative to, to where you guys are? Yeah, the first one I, I showed, Apia Bio, that's actually probably late, uh, earlier stage than us, not expecting to get to the clinical trial stage of drug development until the end of 2023. We are hoping to, to reach that point faster. Uh, and they, they just did a, a deal with Kite Pharma, a very well-known cell therapy company for 875 million. So it does demonstrate that there is potential for early stage um, commercial activity in the space. Uh, the other two, Cure and, um, and Mink, they are early stage phase one. So they're, they're, they are a bit further along than us, but still not a, not a huge amount further. So there's a, there's a good benchmark for, for investors to, to compare themselves with the value in the market. That's right. And I'll, I'll just point it out, but Mink actually um, only recently had a valuation of about 650 million US. But I think with the there has been a bit of a challenge for biotech stocks across the US and also Australia in the last few months. So it's it's um, we're hoping that that will bounce back. Yeah, certainly, it certainly has been a, a sector of the market that um, has been hit re relatively hard. Now, can you give us um, some more colour on timing and milestones? I know you touched on it, but just quickly. What are the next sort of uh, milestones to uh, emerge? Yeah, absolutely. So for the uh, our most advanced product, the iron, the CAR19 INKT cell therapy, what we need to do is manufacture the product uh, at what we call GMP grade so that we can get that into clinical trials. And so we recently announced that we've selected the manufacturer for, for two of the most important components, uh, what are called a plasma DNA and the lentiviral vector. So we've kicked that work off uh, and now we're just going through that process of getting those two materials made. The next step that we're hoping to complete by the end of this quarter is to select the actual cell manufacturer. Again, it's a very important decision. Um, and once we've, we've got the first two materials, they, they dovetail into the cell therapy manufacturer. And once we've got all those materials together, we start phase one clinical trials. And for the, um, the other therapy, l 101 at slightly earlier stage, where what we're going to be doing is taking the therapy as it exists today. So it's been used in a different cell, the T cell, and they've got excellent data in blood cancers, lung cancer, um, pancreatic cancer and breast cancer. But what we're going to be doing is taking that, that portion of the, the monoclonal antibody or the CAR and combining that with our INKT cell therapy. And so that will be done over the course of this year. And we're hoping that we'll actually have better activity uh, and that will be in animal models, but better activity in, in that uh, setting. when we've got that in our INKT cell therapy platform. And then we'll kick off the manufacturing uh, campaign for that product as well before taking that into clinical trials. Great, thanks, Michael. That's all we have time for. There's a couple more questions there if you'd like to answer them. If not, I'll send them through over the weekend. Um, we'll follow your progress and um, have you back on later in the year. Great. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Thanks, Michael. That's all we have time for, everyone. Uh, we've got some great companies next week. See you then. Have a nice weekend.